Hello. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our Sunday afternoon session. Um, you know, we did this during the summer, and then people enjoyed it pretty much, so we decided to do a few more. So I'll have to take that later. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so we're planning to have a couple more of these sessions. Uh, you know, we'll do one. The week before Thanksgiving, that'd be the third week, the third Sunday, instead of the fourth, just to leave that weekend open if people like to move around. And uh, then we'll do them in January, February, and March, the fourth uh, Sunday afternoon. And we have a variety of people that will join us to be speakers. And, you know, not all will be long talks, they'll be short. You know, we'll probably have more on the idea that we're floating around about serving more coffee and stuff so that people can mingle a little bit more. And, be a little more social. So uh, with all that in mind, I'll go ahead and keep going. And um, anyway, I'm Dave Small, president of the Bernadette Club, for those that don't know. And uh, really, uh, you know, um, you know, you always see bats associated with Halloween. Yet in reality, most of the bats we have in Massachusetts are long gone by the time Halloween comes around. You figure that they all feed on insects and stuff, but certainly not a lot of uh, food for them to be really uh, eating as they get into this season. So, we'll get there. I've had this issue before. Hmm. Well, it was working 10 minutes ago. Oh, no, no. And sometimes if you hit the space bar, it'll oh, I got there. So, yeah, we'll get this as the move along. Anyway, uh, again, bats are, you know, most active during the summer season. This is a little brown, a big brown bat. This is probably the only one that's still in pretty good shape around the area. Um, and uh, we actually have nine species of bat that occur in Massachusetts. And um, you see them here, and, and uh, a lot of them are uh, this top group are called myotis. Um, this is eastern small footed myotis, which we always said bat um, interchangeably. And then the, the long eared bat, the Indiana bat, the tricolored bat, the big brown, the silver haired, the eastern red bat, the little brown myotis, and the hoary bat. So a lot of the bats that we have here really suffer a great deal from the uh, white nose syndrome. And uh, white nose syndrome is a fungus that uh, appeared in some of our local caves in, in New York first, and then it reached into New England, and now it's pretty much across the country. And um, as you see on the face of these bats up here on the top left, they really, um, you know, it's kind of a, a white fungus that, that grows on their face. And it's really kind of this an irritant. And what happens with a lot of these bats that were in caves out in the Berkshires and the Adirondacks, um, as it would, these bats would wake up in the middle of the winter and be irritated. You know, it's like when you have like a an itch or poison ivy or something, you know, you're trying to sleep and you can't. And then you wind up using up your reserves and you think, well, geez, I better go eat something. Well, they go out in the middle of January to look for insects, don't find any, further deplete their reserves, and they don't make it through the winter. This is kind of what it looks at close up. It's a little brown bat um, from the New York group. Um, again, this is, um, I think they pretty much get it stabilized at this point. But with many of these bats, they only have one or two uh, cups a year. And it takes a long time to rebuild that population. You know, we went from 10,000 bats in a cave to single digits. So, I mean, it was really, uh, you know, just a complete uh, collapse of the whole, of the whole uh, group. So um, it's really important that, that we, we've learned a lot about this. They're still studying it. And uh, they're actually looking at methodologies to help control that fungus. So... If you look at our bats, 
Um, the two on the top, the long eared and the Indiana bats, are actually both state listed and federally listed. And by listed, I mean that uh, there's an Endangered Species Act, both in Massachusetts and the federal, that protects species that are in, you know, danger of becoming extinct. And the three um, categories are endangered, which is the highest category, which means they're really in trouble, threatened, which is an intermediate category, and then special concern. And what happened in the last, um, just the last two weeks, uh, the bottom three bats were actually proposed for listing as special concern. And the reason that it's special concern, because it's criteria about how you evaluate these, is that there's not enough baseline data to really let us know how far they've dropped. And we don't really know what a good population level would be to know that we're recovering. So they'll be studied in the next few years if it gets approved. It's, it went through. I happen to be on the Heritage Committee uh, that, that uh, votes on whether to, to, to uh, list these things. And um, so hopefully in the next three years, we'll have a better understanding of what the population baseline is, and we can make a more, more determined evaluation of uh, what's going on. Here's um, the one that isn't in too tough a shape. This is the big brown bat. And uh, these we have around um, still. And again, they're not associated as much with um, uh, caves or anything. So they're not, they're not into that, into that syndrome. On these, um, the bottom three actually are also not as associated with caves. And they actually live in the forest and are kind of separate and have kind of solitary lifestyles. But the problem with these guys is we think there's probably the decline in overall decline in insects that their food sources are completed that. And they also have an affinity for a windmill. And it's even thought that they actually get attracted to them because of the sound of the windmill. And so that's being studied now and there's actually um, bat deterrent things that designing to put on windmills to make them not an issue. But it's just something that's, uh, that's ongoing. Uh, even now. So this is the big brown bat. You see it gets all the way across the country and uh, it still is one that um, is doing okay. Now, you people probably all know that the bats are out there looking for food, which really consists of mostly moths and other live flying insects, depending on the size of the bat. And they do that through echolocation. I mean, they send out radar signals. The moth interrupts that signal. When the signal comes back to the bat, you can figure out where the bat is. This is the food source. This is from my house in the middle of summer where I do a lot of moth looking. And uh, these are, this is what the bats are after. And uh, the, different, the different moths and other night flying insects that they can find. And you see there's quite a variety of different sizes and shapes and colors and stuff that you can find right in the uh, right here in Apple. So here's a picture of the sonar, you know, going out and then seeing the bat, uh, seeing the moth, and the signal returns back to the to the bat, and it, it kind of sees that it can locate where that insect is flying. When I was uh, I took a class out in Arizona on moths, and there was a researcher there that was working on um, several different moths that actually are emitting a sound that confuses the echolocation of the bat. So this guy had had uh, really fine monofilament line that he had the, the moth on, and he had high-speed cameras and high-speed recorders that he could actually hear what the moth was emitting and hear what the bat was emitting and actually could see that the moth was actually fooling the bat with this cross signal. So cool stuff and, and um, you know, this stuff is really interesting research-wise and, you know, evolutionary-wise. So nowadays we have two tools to help us actually uh, listen to bats. The bat frequency, that, that radar frequency is not in our hearing range. And, uh, Certainly, the, um, um, in order for us to detect bats are present, 
we need a, a tool, which is the recorder, to take that high pitch sound and bring it down to a human hearing level and actually produce, if you see um, on the chart here, there's actually, uh, like it produces a sonogram, which is like a digital image of what the sound is. And then with computer programs, they can take that sonogram and match it up to different species of bats in their echolocation and work on identifying the species, which bat is which one that's actually singing out in the, or hunting out in the, out of the field. So these are these are fun things. Um, I've got I've got this one here for my phone, and they're just changing the way that hooks to my phone, so I don't know if it's going to work next year or not. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they're pretty cool, and uh, there's a lot of different surveys that go on. I know at Quabbin, the biologists at Quabbin are doing regular bat surveys now, and um, and they're really getting again working on that baseline of uh, which bats are where and how common they are. All right. Um, so this one I've had some personal experience with. This is the long-eared bat, and it's um, a federally endangered uh, animal. And uh, about 15 or more years ago, um, there was a team from uh, West Virginia, a U.S. Forest Service team that was studying bats, and they came up to Quabbin and with the UMass people, and we um, actually went out and misnetted the bats at night um, right in the middle of Quabbin. And um, this is out on Texas Peninsula, actually. And uh, the only misnet is, it's, we use it for birds all the time for, for studying birds, and it's just a really fine net, you know, a couple of holes, like a badminton net. And the birds or the bat fly into it, and then you can extricate them, and you know, we weigh them and we do all that kind of stuff with them. And on um, this night, we actually put a transmitter on the bat because they wanted to see where the bat was roosting during the daytime. So this is um, this is the bat, and again, you know, wearing gloves, they you know. Yeah, but this is where that bat wound up roosting during the day. And um, it's just basically a tree in the forest. And anytime there's like a loose bark on a tree or a, or a cavity or whatever, the, the bats will get in there and get out of the weather and actually uh, spend the day um, hidden out of sight. And then they come out again during the day, during the night and feed. And um, some of these actually are paternal roost sites. And you know, they're again, these don't have big groups of bats together, but they'll actually can have up to two offspring that they raise in these little isolated um, forests. So, a lot of interest in these bats, and uh, we're learning more all the time. Now, <clears throat> more readily, there's, there's bat houses, and I have one here you can look at after. Um, you know, these are relatively simple devices. Um, that you can you can get um, bats to use those instead of coming into your house necessarily. You might you know not be thrilled to have them in the bedroom, but um, but anyway they 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 can you can have them at, you know in your yard. They eat a lot of insects. You know depending on the species, they can do a lot of biting insects, and um, it's really pretty pretty good. And there's a couple different designs, and I'll talk about more of that as we get to it. But this is. You know the um, the basic one here on the left is um, is what you're seeing here, and you can make them with different um, numbers of chambers. And one that's actually been pretty successful is a freestanding um, unit that's called the rocket, and um, and you can actually uh, uh, make these. And the whole idea of the different chambers and the different um, configurations is that they thermoregulate. I mean, they have to regulate their, their hot and coldness as they go through. And if it's really warm, they want to be cooler. And if it's really cold, they want to be warmer, like the rest of it. So um, by having the different chambers and the different aspects, you can uh, actually uh, have places within the, the house <clears throat> that have different temperatures. And they can move around and get to the temperature they want. This is a house that's over in New Salem and um, been very active in the back of a barn. Um, quite often, if you have this type of house, they do like to be up against the building 
um, you know, wood or you know, what they don't like is, is uh, aluminum siding and stuff, but they don't mind even concrete or, or um, you know, shingles or, or, or clabbers. Um, but they, that also helps to, to uh, keep the temperatures fairly stable. And if they're out in the open, you know, the, the, with, between wind and sun and everything else, the temperatures can fluctuate quite a bit. So they seem to really like these these ones that are onto the building. Um, although the other ones will work in, in circumstances, but but they do um, they do seem to work. So here's looking up at the house, um, and um, I think I counted 68 bats in here, um, and uh, you know, they're just, just hanging there waiting for the, you know, during the day. And uh, they're pretty cool. And the whole idea being, you know, that, that we have them and you see that they're kind of in the middle of this of this house, you know, not in the extreme. So they're kind of congregating up, kind of looking for the same thermal uh, signature. And it's just cool. So on this here, You go out right at dusk and watch them head out to, uh, to feed. And uh, they just drop down and head off, to, head off to go look for insects. Yeah, this video was taken by Steve DiStefano, a wildlife biologist over in the channel. And of course, the easy way to tell whether or not the house is being used is you look at the, at the on the ground under the house, and you'll see piles of guano that that uh, actually builds up pretty good. You get you know sixty or eighty bats in the house that are there all day, and uh, they make themselves known pretty well. So. Just to let you know that there's going to be a workshop someday, a uh, week from today, at uh, Guy Fields Arboretum, and it's right here in Apple, and they're going to be building bat boxes. So I think the, the uh, buy in is 20 bucks of materials, and they'll help you put them together and show you, you know, where to put them and all that stuff. So that's going to be an interesting you know, afternoon for folks. So um, really encourage you. They're one of our partners here. So we uh, we definitely appreciate uh, having them. So to learn more about bats in general, um, the uh, the international um, bat, bat international bat conservation international um, is a uh, is a great a great organization, and um, I should have hit this before. Well, that wasn't it. Oh, well. There we go. Um, so anyway, so they're, you know, they're pretty, um, uh, there's tons and tons of information at this website. Um, you know, down in Texas, this is a, a Mexican free tail bat, and they like to hang around under some of these bridges and stuff down there. And I was down there, and you know, there was probably 10,000 bats um, on this one bridge down in San Antonio. And the Texas Highway Department, you don't think of Texas as being very progressive sometimes, but they actually, the Highway Department was actually building the new bridges with a, with actually a place for bats to roost. So kind of cool. Um, the reality of it is that they're a great tourist attraction. And uh, you know, people go down and they have cafes set up, and you can sit and watch the bats and you know, have a beverage or whatnot and enjoy them. So um, there's always something uh, ulterior motives, I suppose. But uh, but again, really good stuff with the bats, and and uh, you know, we need to do whatever we can to, to try to keep them going. And uh, and whatever. So um, with that. I will um, answer any questions. Yes, Adia.
One of the, the things that I think quite a few people worry about with bats is the possibility of carrying rabies. And how, how frequent in bat populations is rabies? Or is, th is this something that fluctuates a great deal year to year as it has, for example, in raccoons? Right. And, so and I think that true answer is the second one you have, but it does fluctuate. Uh, we don't have enough bats that are that numerous or populous that it spreads between them. Most of the bats we have left at the big brown aren't necessarily in, you know, in big clusters all the time. Um, but anyway, I, I, I don't think it's as much of a threat as it would have been 10 years ago when we had lots of different species available all the time. Yeah. I don't know if anybody at home, we have to have the people at home also to put something in the chat or try to answer it. Uh, yeah. What species of bats in Massachusetts would use a, a box? Okay, the big brown bats will, uh, the little brown bats will, if there's any around. And, uh, but the big brown is mostly right now, would be what you'd be shooting for. Yeah? Yes, in the back, sir. Was <laughs> that an app on your phone or? Yeah, you buy, you buy it's, a, it's a, a unit that you buy and it comes with an app. Oh. You know, you need the hardware also. Where did, where did you get it? Um, um, wildlife Acoustics. You know, it's a Massachusetts company and they have a numerous uh, different bat monitoring things. Those are two, three hundred dollars for that unit. Yeah. Um, you got it on line? Yeah. Yeah, wildlife acoustics. Yeah, bad houses need to be cleaned out. Actually, for the most part, they don't, because they're pretty much, they, everything dropped right out of them. So it's, um, they're pretty self-cleaning. Compared to bird boxes that I have to open a door and whatnot, but gravity is a great thing. All right. One more question. Okay, we have more questions. Yeah. She reminded um, her, um, do they travel anywhere and migrate in the winter? And then the second question is, what can we do to help the bat populations? Okay, so the um, those three bats that I mentioned earlier, the uh, they were at the bottom of that chart, uh, actually <clears throat> migrate further south. The red bat and stuff. And sometimes, you know, it was probably about a month ago. I saw one or two flying, you know, probably in late afternoon, and it actually flies to a place where they're where the winter's on as bad, you know, probably to Cape May or whatever, or somewhere down south. So some do. And then the others that we're having all the trouble with actually fly uh, to caves, you know, out of the Berkshires or whatever. Um, I have friends on Martha's Vineyard that were trying to track bats, what's happening to the bats out there. And they've actually found that the summer homes out there, uh, where people don't go in the winter, make wonderful bat habitat in these cellars of these homes that are otherwise just sitting there quiet and vacant. And uh, so they found quite a few there. It's like a, you know, an artificial cave you know, for them. So, um, so there are things like that that are happening. And, and again, monitoring some of these things, you know, we didn't know what was going on until they started using these bat detectors and tracking these bats and see where they went. So uh, they have a whole team out there that's been doing that for a while. That's uh, biodiversity works and working on that. So there's, you know, again, there's all kinds of things. Yes? Um, uh, they have potentially the, uh, to be a vector species for rabies. If you find an injured bat, what do you call, what do you do, who do you reach out to? All right, so um, for the most part in your house, um, the best thing is to try not to handle it if you can help it. You know, you you uh, close any doors in that room and open the windows, turn the lights off, and it may find its way out on its own. Um, I've actually uh, helped some people out. I use my butterfly net to grab them and just bring them out. But the idea is not to handle them if you can help it. 
you know, because they can't give you rabies unless they actually bite you. So, uh, you know, so the idea is to minimize your personal contact, you know. So if you have trouble, give us a call or I know some people that can, that can help. Yes, Elise. This is just a comment uh, that the bat iguana is a great fertilizer for house plants and other yes. plants. That's another benefit of having a bat house. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Do you know what kinds of strategies are being used against the white nose fungus? I don't know what the current is being used. I know what's been tried. I know they've actually had some fungicide that they, you know, that they set up at the entrance of the cave to kind of give them a little sprays they've been through. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, they, I know that they're working on a lot of things, and I don't know where the current status is. It's, they're, they're pretty far flung what they're working on so at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, the two types of bat houses, what you have here, the current bed then was a daytime roosting place. And they need. Yeah, that's a daytime roosting site. Yeah, they need, the big ones are called colonies, breeding colonies. Yeah, so it depends on the number of chambers that you have inside. You know, they really say um, if you have three or more chambers, it's a little bit better because it has more thermal dynamics going on with warmer and colder spots within the house. But uh, but that's basic, that's the basic design right there, you know. So, and depending where you live in the country, um, you can paint that. If you're in a place that has you know really high temperatures, like over 80 degrees, like you're in Texas, you're painting with a reflective water-based paint to, to deflect heat off of it. If you live in our climate, maybe something in a brown. If you live a little further north, um, probably something, uh, you know, even in a black or something that, that absorbs more heat. So uh, you can help. Again, we're thinking about thermal regulation as the, as the criteria for an active house. Yes? I was just curious about the, curious about the current status with white nose. Do they think the ones that are still left alive are genetically resistant or? I think, there's some, I think there's some resistance that is going on. And uh, and some of these are actually, um, um, you know, really. I mean, it was really tough. I mean, you know, what what happened in that whole time was really a very sad, sad thing. And all those, you know, thousands of bats just died, you know, because they didn't make it through the winter. You know, so um, we can only hope. But again, it'll take a long time to rebound. You know, because um, they only have, like, say, one or two bats a year. And it takes, they only live for 10 to 15 years in the wild, you know, and they probably don't start giving birth for the second or third year anyway. So, it's, you know, it's a long process to get back. But, uh, but certainly there, there's lots of people working on it, and the, 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 the knowledge of what's going on changes pretty regularly. Yeah. You have a couple of questions that look Oh, I like does look like it. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. Now I have to use my glasses. I did that one. Yeah, she's talking about compost. And, um, you know, if you have that one, I'll, you know, really um, any kind of simple compost system to, to let it decompose is, is quite good. Um, it's pretty strong, you know, when it's raw, you know. Um, but anyway, so I, I just say, Deb, uh, yeah, some sort of simple compost system. You can get them pretty simple. I mean, it doesn't take a lot. Yeah. So David, it looks like she's saying, what, uh, how can, is, is there a process to make it safe to use it on a garden? So I guess that would beg the question why would it be unsafe? Well, it's probably too um, <clears throat> full of nitrogen, I guess, when they're, when they're raw. You know what I mean? So you like you'd like to let it compost for for you know a few months before you actually use it on the garden. So any kind of a simple compost system would work. All right. Hey, just a quick comment. Yeah. 
when we went to Austin, Texas to explore the city, we did get to see the the bats. Yeah. They even had called the parking lot like bat parking. It was a whole commodity thing, like hundreds of people on there. But it was literally the highlight of the whole vacation for me. Mm. There, it went on for ten or fifteen minutes. All we just glor- we were all just standing there, and then the bats just gloriously went across the sky. Yeah, that's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. I've been I've seen it myself. It's it's worth it when you're if you're down in that country to, to take time to do that. It's it's, a, it's one of those forces of nature that you should try to check out. You know, it's like seeing. You know, the snow geese or some other things that by the tens of thousands, these bats are in the tens of thousands. So, not say Mexican retails that are down there. Pretty cool stuff. All right. So, with that, any other questions here? I think we'll um, call that uh, a day then. And um, thank you all at home and those of us that are here for uh, being so cooperative.